For those of you who have just joined us, thank you and welcome to the Carbon Farm webinar put forward by Fibershed. My name is Rebecca Burgess. I'm the founder of Fibershed and I'm going to do a brief intro. And before I do that, I just wanted to acknowledge uh, today that there might be a lot of um, questions and there is a way to type your questions in at the bottom of your screen. So that is um, something you can do during the presentation and then we can address your questions at the end. We'll give a few minutes for that. And as, if your question wasn't addressed um, by the team, then we will email you an answer because we might run out of time. And today you're gonna hear from Heather on funding mechanisms and carbon farm practice, uh, funding mechanisms, public and private, as well as some of our state goals. You're gonna hear from Amy, Aaron, um, Amy, Jim, and Sarah, I should say, all producers. Erin uh, is also a producer, but she's also our Carbon Farm cohort organizer. So there's a, a range of narratives you will hear about local uh, work being done um, to implement carbon farming uh, from the voices of those doing it. And, um, and then also you'll hear some overview efforts and how our work aligns with state goals um, and also global goals to meet our climate objectives. Um, so I'll begin with a brief overview. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us today. It's good to have you all here. And so I'm, this is a slide uh, that you're, hopefully you can see uh, in front of you and why we're doing this work. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jeff Creek for sharing this slide. So if you look, uh, if you can see my cursor, we call this the modern era. This is where greenhouse gas emissions have brought us in terms of um, our our pre-industrial civilization uh, GHG numbers. So we call this, uh, this period of time that we've developed civilization, the Holocene, and we've had fairly stable temperatures due to the fact that the long wave radiation from the sun has been able to leave the planet. There's been nothing trapping that heat for some time until we developed um, a civilization based on the burning of fossil carbon which has emitted heat trapping gases, a blanket that covers our atmosphere, trapping the heat. Um, and you can see how uh, striking these emissions uh, move into a range where humans haven't coexisted on the planet during a period when the emissions um, have been so high, meaning the CO2E, which is carbon dioxide, nitrous oxide, and methane emissions. We did not co-evolve on a planet that ever had this level of concentrated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. The planet has had concentrations of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere prior to humans, um, but again, we're in uncharted territory and um, we're already seeing the impacts of the warming. And so there are many commitments that have been made. Um, let's see if I can change slides. Oops, sorry. Um, Okay, I'm gonna have to I think my screen is frozen. I apologize. Um, yep. All right. Well, let's try. Okay. <laughs> there we go. So one of the key um, leaders in global climate conversation, Christiana Fugueres, um, has been talking about how fast we have to act. Here you see a quote from her, emissions must peak by 2020. That means the emissions from smokestacks and tailpipes and industrial civilization as a whole. That means we have to peak and start seeing a drawdown after 2020, and it's almost 2019. Some say that that is impossible, but impossible is an attitude, not a fact. Agriculture has a critical role to play, both in dramatically reducing emissions and by providing a sink to draw down carbon from the atmosphere. And it is agreed upon by science as a whole right now that all teams see that there is a gap between the two degree commitment that the world has made. We don't want to see our planet warm beyond two degrees and the emissions that have been pledged to be reduced by all the countries that signed on to the Paris Agreement. Those emissions, uh, those emissions reduction pledges don't meet the two degree mark. There is only one way to meet that mark and it's through net negative strategy. Net negative means in the ground. <laughs> and so James Hansen, a NASA scientist, has also talked about this in his um, Our Children's Burden paper. Um, so 
everyone's acknowledging that we need to sink carbon into our soils. And the French Ministry of Agriculture developed this strategy coming out of uh, the COP21 um, agreements, the 4 per 1000 initiative. What if we could increase our soil organic carbon by 0.4% per year? And if we were to do this annually on all the existing agricultural soils, uh, we could offset all global CO2 emissions. So that's a pretty powerful role that the soil carbon pool plays. Um, it's again, to, to implement this is the trick, <laughs> but we know how powerful our soils are in solving this crisis. Um, what would four per 1000 for California look like? Uh, if you go here to by, by 2030, if we were to take this bottom line here, um, just looking at our cropland and pasture land only, irrigated pasture and cropland where we grow row crops, we could look at, we could potentially see a 58 million, about 59 million metric ton sequestration just by initiating four per 1000 on these land types. So what is Fibershow doing in this regard? Um, we would uh, very much like to see a 0.4% increase in soil organic carbon in our community. Uh, what you see before you is all the sites where producers in the Fibershed Producer Program have taken soil organic carbon tests. Uh, they've sampled their soils from zero to 45 centimeter depths. Um, we have a lot of room to sink carbon in this community. Around less than 5% of the sites tested had 2.4 to 4% soil organic, um, that's just say soil organic carbon, I'm sorry, in the zero to 15 centimeter depth. So in just below the plow layer, we do have some sites, very few, that are starting to um, tack up their carbon. And these sites I noticed were riparian areas where there's fresh water running through the land base. They were barn sites where a lot of manure had accumulated. And they were also where compost was applied topically to crop lands. But how could we get these numbers and higher numbers from our rangelands and our crop lands as a whole? The remaining soil samples in our fiber shed citizen science uh, project in 15 to 45 centimeter depths, we saw as little as 0.1% soil organic, actually it should say soil organic carbon, and 2 point to 2.4%. So we have a lot of room to uh, increase the carbon and improve the ecological debt. Just for reference, California has lost around 50% of its carbon in its rangelands. Those are the unirrigated uh, grazed landscapes in California. So again, when you lose a lot, it means you have a debt, but it's a debt that where you could actually fulfill that debt through sinking carbon. So um, before we complete this intro, I just wanted to quote um, a colleague and a friend, John Wick, um, just to inspire all of us um, that agriculture really is the art of moving carbon between carbon pools to produce food, fuel, fiber, and flora. So we are all scientists, we're all artists, we're all practitioners, and we all hold a very vital part of the solution at a time when things feel actually quite dire. Um, so this is what we want to do. We want to take these um, emissions that have been peaking, 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 peaking. And again, this is an old slide. <laughs> we were hoping we would see peak emissions by 2010. Unfortunately, the, the numbers have gone up considerably. But if we could start bending this, this uh, down, this little uh, interannual flux of carbon you see here is just the boreal forest and plankton absorbing CO2 every year. There's a six part per million variability every time uh, CO2 is sequestered by Earth's biosphere. Um, if we could actually just enhance the amount of carbon we're sequestering every year, we could start bending the curve back to safe levels. Um, so now I'm going to um, to say that yes, we can do this, we have to implement quickly, and we need inspired, passionate um, people, and you're going to hear from a lot of them right now. <laughs> so I will um, pass this to Heather. Thank you so much, everyone. And Heather, you're next. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, okay, I'm going to just pull up my slides for everyone also. All 
All right, so before we dive into getting some uh, stories directly from some other practitioners in our producer community who are uh, taking up this, the challenge of a societal need and seeing that it, it matches with something that can actually benefit their land by, by bringing carbon back into their landscape. Um, we're, we really want to have you hear directly from some of the people who are making those practices happen. Um, and I'm gonna just frame that conversation a little bit with an overview of some of the practices that uh, are seeming to be most relevant and are beginning to be practiced in Northern California. I'm gonna talk briefly about some of the funding opportunities to support implementation of these practices and um, some of the values we're seeing with carbon farm planning for, for the producers themselves. So um, just as, a, as an overall story about what, um, is, what options we have here in Northern California for taking this, this drawdown need and making it real on our properties, uh, there are over 30 practices that the Natural Resources Conservation Service of the USDA has identified as having significant potential to sequester carbon um, on agricultural landscapes. And this list um, shows a number of those that are particularly relevant here. Um, within this list of practices, there are a number of options for federal and state support to help producers uh, implement these practices. As Rebecca outlined, the, um, you know, the societal benefits that these practices have at a larger scale make this uh, something that producers should not have to shoulder on their own implementing these practices. Uh, so a program that has been around for some time through the USDA at a federal level um, is the EQIP program, Environmental Quality Incentives Program. Producers can find out more about uh, specific practices and opportunities through their local RCD and NRCS offices. Um, within California, there's growing number of opportunities for producers to gain support for these practices through the California Healthy Soils Program. And we're gonna hear um, from Amy in just a minute who has received one of these uh, grants from the state of California to implement carbon farming. Um, this, we were hoping when we scheduled this webinar that the announcement for the 2019 round, the second round of Healthy Soils would have been announced. Um, it's anticipating any day now. Um, but there, there is a second round coming out very soon. And one thing we're really happy about with the second round is that there is going to be a, a deeper level of technical assistance available. There's more funding that's been allocated um, to technical assistance for the Healthy Soils Program in this round. So that's gonna be something much more available to producers who are looking to apply and understand what what this program could do for them. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about those practices in a minute, but I just also wanted to mention that in addition to public funding for carbon farming practices, um, something that's been very significant um, within our producer community and, and hopefully in a uh, increasing way is the market-based type of funding that's available to support implementation of carbon farming. So um, Fibershed has established a carbon farm fund um, that is connected with our climate beneficial verification program. And through, through this program, we're able to accept donations um, that are associated with the, the production of certain fiber products um, that are being verified through climate beneficial. And that allows for uh, those funds to be ch channeled directly to support practices. And so far in Northern California, we've seen uh, $41,375 raised uh, to, the, to directly support on the ground practices of producers. Most often this is going back directly to the land base where the fiber products associated with those donations came from. Um, in, in addition to that, uh, we've seen $25,000, over $25,000 in price premiums um, associated with the Climate Beneficial Program that's verifying um, a comprehensive planning process and uh, implementation of these uh, proven carbon farm practices. So we're excited that there's both op options to have public funding and market-based support 
um, to make this an accessible option for producers. I want to spend just a couple minutes talking about the California Healthy Soils Program and the opportunities that that is bringing forward for some of our producers. Um, in 2017-18, the first solicitation of the Healthy Soils Program went out uh, with a total of $7.5 million allocated across the state. Um, within that first round, five fiber shed producers um, were able to receive awards um, and that came out to about $65,000. Um, the next solicitation that, as I said, um, was supposed to be announced in November. Um, we're getting pretty close to the end of November, so um, it really could be any day, hopefully in the next week, um, we will know exactly what the application window is and there will be um, clarity on exactly which organizations have received extra funding to support applications. Um, so there's a number of RCDs around the state that have already applied for this and are now uh, designated as technical assistance providers for the Healthy Soils Program. And that means um, that throughout the state, there will be um, support for anyone who wants to apply for this program to have their application assisted with. Um, there should be a planning assistance um, and other outreach. So um, that should be coming out in the next week. And in this second solicitation, um, we have doubled the amount of money available across the state, 15 million, so twice what was offered in the first solicitation. And we um, are just very excited that this is being offered to fiber shed producers as well as the larger pool of producers in California. And we um, would love to support any of you that are interested in applying. Um, if you have questions about that, you can either go directly to your local RCD or if you are looking for a referral for technical uh, assistance, feel free to reach out to us. Um, I wanted to run through the list of some of the practices that are going to be funded through this program because there are some new practices being offered this time that weren't offered in the first round. Um, compost application is now um, a, a, an option that will be both um, compost derived from on-farm compost uh, that is produced according to certain guidelines for temperature management, um, as well as um, compost coming from a state certified facility. So there's a little bit more flexibility and options for producers in the compost management. There's also um, a higher reimbursement rate on compost, which is something we're happy about because um, that was really not uh, high enough for most producers to feel that it, it helped enough to overcome the cost barrier. Uh, herbaceous cover is another type of practice that's covered. Some of the practices um, that will be relevant to our producers uh, herbaceous cover, forage, and biomass planting will all have some incentive payments associated with them. This photo shows uh, an herbaceous cover implemented in the Delta area in Solano County with a producer in our network who's um, finding that, you know, some of these practices are directly related to increasing productivity through building soil carbon. Some of them have other associated ecosystem benefits that ultimately can help the farm um, as a whole. Uh, woody cover establishment is another category of healthy soils practices that are eligible for reimbursement. Uh, you can see a list of them here, alley cropping, hedgerow planting, riparian forest buffer, windbreak and shelter belt. We have a picture here of a uh, shelter belt uh, windbreak that's gone in in Northeast California on a ranch with a one mile linear feet of uh, windbreak that went in this this fall. There's some very large scale projects that are happening in the, in the carbon farming planning process. Uh, also in grazing lands practices in the Healthy Soils program during this round, uh, prescribed grazing has been added as an incentives practice. So we're really happy knowing that many of our fiber shed producer members uh, expressed interest in that practice. And this could be a way for um, helping support uh, more people to implement cross fencing and other um, infrastructure that would help support prescribed grazing. Silvopasture, as, as shown in this picture, is um, grazing animals under um, trees, which can have a lot of carbon benefits as well as benefits for the ecosystem and the farming system. Um, so as Rebecca pointed out, this, this funding is, is tied very much to the 
recognition, this public funding, that as a, as a whole in society, there are great benefits when agricultural producers are able to implement these practices. Um, it, it not only in the long term can increase the productivity, the water holding capacity of their farms and ranches, um, but it provides a service to society. And one of the challenges um, that comes up for quantifying those benefits is having a comprehensive way to hold um, the planning process and the validation of implementation so we can keep track. So uh, you're probably familiar that uh, California established a goal in just two months ago that we could reach carbon neutrality by 2045. Um, this is a really ambitious and important goal and we are gonna have a big, uh, a big lift to make that happen. The four per 1000 initiative that Rebecca described is, is one ambitious goal. Um, an, another frame that some advocates in California are taking on is the idea that by 2030, uh, we can set a goal to sequester 130 million metric tons of carbon dioxide on natural and working lands in California. This is a plan that's being worked out um, and put forward by, by a number of uh, agriculture and advocacy groups. So how do we keep track of that? Carbon farm planning is something that a couple of our presenters are going to go into on a little more depth on a specific level and that will give you a little better idea of how one farm takes that on um, to understand what's possible on their farm and create a roadmap. Um, using tools like Comet Farm Planner is a modeling tool that is associated with carbon farm planning. And that helps um, collect a, a huge body of research that's been done in both in California and around um, the United States to understand what these practices are capable of doing on different landscapes and quantify what we can expect the benefits will be when they're implemented. So having that quantification uh, codified in a carbon farm planning process is really important. Erin is going to talk more about how um, the group of producers she's working with are doing that kind of planning work. And um, I just wanted to quickly mention that this is something relevant um, really across the whole spectrum of scale that our producers work at, including um, some of our largest ranches. Um, Bear Ranch is a 4,500 acre uh, ranch in Northern California, and they've taken on carbon farm planning uh, at, at a really comprehensive level and are looking at what's possible on their landscape with um, a number of practices, including what's shown here, compost application and uh, the Hedra windbreak establishment. And we also have very, um, very small scale and everything in between um, embracing and taking on carbon farming. In, in Chico, we uh, saw Chico Flax Project received a Healthy Soils uh, grant in the last round to put in a 1600 linear feet hedgerow and um, also to put co uh, cover crops across their just under four acre plot. Um, so even though they're working at a much smaller scale, they're maximizing the carbon capture on their landscape and they've engaged a, a wide range of community members and research and education um, demonstration opportunities. So there, there's room at every scale for this to be uh, a really important and relevant um, undertaking. So um, I'm going to now pass on uh, to Amy, who's going to tell us a little bit in more depth about the work that she's done on, on her property in Petaluma. She's going to go a little bit more in detail about the how um, of what she's been doing. Okay. Okay, sorry, bear with me as I pull this up. Okay, Amy. Actually, 
need to change your name, but you can Go ahead. start it. Take your time. Um, so you might just want to start. I'm gonna go back to the beginning. Okay, all right. Let's go back up to the first one. Yeah. How do we get a big screen? There you okay, go. great. So, hi everybody. I'm Amy Skeezus, and I'm really happy to talk with you today. Um, there's a lot of information in my slides, and we have only a limited time. So, don't worry if you can't read all the data that's on the slides. It's uh, intended for you to be able to go back as a resource for the people who really actually want to figure out how to do this on their places. And I'll just be speaking, kind of giving you the overview. So I'm a small holder. I have a little place. I'm not a big guy, but I managed to win one of these Healthy Soils grants. And I want to give you the confidence and excitement to give it a try yourself. So. Uh, my husband and I live on a little over nine acres. It's mostly grassland in Sonoma County. The, um, the carbon situation is quite disturbing to me on the planetary level. And so we asked ourselves, well, what can we do about this in a way of good spirit? You know, a place of abundance, a place of happiness and joy and excitement. And carbon farming is really it. Um, I'm going to focus in this presentation on our carbon farming practice of compost application to some of our grazing lands. So this is the famous Marin Carbon Project um, slide of the carbon cycle. What is really going on when we say we take it out of the atmosphere and put it into the soil. And Marin Carbon Project proved scientifically, conclusively, carbon farming works. It adds value for the farmer to the land, and it adds value to the watershed, the community around the farm, and it adds value to the planet. So for the farmers out there, here's just a few key facts. One single half inch deep compost application increased soil water holding capacity 17 to 25%. That means more drought resilience. Think about that, 25%. What if we had 25% more rain every year? Wouldn't we all be happy, right? Cover the soil with some compost. You can make that equivalent thing happen on your land. It also increased the above ground forage production by 40 to 70% each year, year after year. Would you like someone to pick up 40 to 70% of your feed bill year after year? It sounds pretty good to me. And the Marin, ranch, the Marin ranch lands are huge. So a lot of times people think, well, I can't do that. But the principles of compost application are effective on any scale. So even if you don't have a big budget or a lot of land or big equipment, I'm here to tell you, you can carbon farm with compost application. We're doing it on a little over one acre of our nine acres. It could be applied anywhere. And four-fifths of the developing world's food is a product of smallholders and family farms. So the potential for this is everywhere. Anybody can do it. When I see grassland now, I see potential. I see a big machine that's just waiting to be turned on and draw down carbon and help everybody all over the world. We got started because I took a permaculture design course and it really lit up a lot of ideas for me. I didn't grow up on a farm. I'm not particularly mechanically handy. I'm a word person, a poet, a writer, but I love animals and I love the earth. And so I took this permaculture course and those folks encouraged me to reach out to my local resource conservation district. <clears throat> That's called RCD. RCD visited our farm, Sonoma County RCD. They liked what they saw us doing. And big deal, they helped us to create a detailed land smart plan. And that's really the basis of our carbon farming work. And they told us about this healthy soils 
incentives program. And they referred us to a great organization, the California Land Stewardship Institute, who is giving a workshop for technical assistance in how to write the grant. That's why I got a grant is because I went to this free workshop and got help and their staff coached me through that grant application afterwards in follow-up emails and on the phone. So there's a lot of help for you. Even if you think, well, I don't know how to write a grant or I don't know what to do technically, you can do it. There's so much support. This is what wants to happen and you can be part of making it happen. So we were one of the smallest landholders to get that grant. And um, we contracted for two practices over three years, which was to apply compost to 1.18 acres and to plant woody cover. And today I'm gonna really focus on the compost application. So here's a map of our little place. Um, let's see, there's the mouse. We have a windbreak of Monterey Cypress that we planted. And this is one of our paddocks where we have silvo pasture. This is where the hedgerow is gonna be for healthy soils. <clears throat> but the main compost business is here, fields two through eight, which is a tiny Lilliputian micro rotational grazing area for tiny sheep. And that's where we're putting that compost. So let's talk dollars and cents. <clears throat> The grant process calls for a certain amount of compost per acre around, we, we went for about five tons dry. We got it from an approved source, West Marin Compost. And <clears throat> they have to deliver it. So there's delivery charge and tax. <clears throat> and our cost out of pocket was $306.25 for that first year. And our entire grant, as Heather said, it wasn't very rich was only for $368.20 for three years. But still, that's 40% of our materials cost. And we're grateful for that because it got us moving and it is support. So now let's talk the nuts and bolts how to do it. Little guy, don't have big equipment, have to get that compost to our house. How big is the delivery truck? Will it fit in the driveway? Luckily, yes, the five ton truck fits in our driveway. They drove it in the back and dumped it in the back pasture. Now the big guys, they use this big equipment, but we don't have that big equipment. So we have a little mini tractor that my husband calls Birdie. How would we use Birdie to help us? Well, standard manure compost spreaders are too big. They weigh as much as Birdie does. So we tested other things that we might be able to hook up to Birdie and we tested manual things. We tried to spread it with hard rakes and spring rakes. But the Healthy Soils grant is for a 1 12th inch depth. And if you have any residual dry matter or any tiny little micro topography on the ground, it's not like cement. You're not spreading it on cement. It just disappears. So rakes were no good. That's the seed spreader that jammed up on Birdie. Didn't work. The compost got caught um, when we tried to push it through. There's the rakes we tried to use, and there are the all-important piece of equipment, the 5.75-gallon buckets, the Ace Hardware plastic bucket, really high-tech, okay? That's what we ended up as our single big important equipment piece. Peter did the math. I'm going to skim through this math stuff in the interest of time. You can come back and watch the film if you want to know how to do it. Here are the constants he used to convert inches to cubic inches to cubic feet to cubic yards because cubic yards and tons, we know the conversion, right? So how do we do it? Peter made the front loader on our birdie bucket bigger so he could take more for each payload. He figured out the volume of the bucket and that told us how many trips he had to make with the tractor to each field. And then once the little piles from Birdie were in the field, we used those 5.75 gallon, gallon buckets and our hands and just scattered it around. Here's Peter and Birdie taking from the delivery pile. How to figure out how many piles per field. Again, we're in math. If you want to see what we did, come back to the slide. Here's Peter <clears throat> in the field with his little pile from Birdie and his little pipe ruler that he made to show us so we could get a good sense of what it looked like, how to broadcast evenly within the field so that we, want, we wanted those benefits everywhere, all over the field. And this is what it actually looks like at 1 12th inch depth in the field. 
Our labor cost, basically one day's work for one acre of a application is a good rule of thumb. More people makes it shorter. Before we started, we did the citizen science program through Fibershed and found out that every acre is already trapping 62,000, 63,000 pounds of carbon. And what the planning process for that Healthy Soils grant estimates is that we're going to sequester five tons more carbon per acre. That's a 16% increase in our carbon sequestration. And remember, Rebecca and Heather said, we want 0.4% increase. Okay, so if you think it's not worth it, think of yourself as a global citizen and say, yeah. So bottom line, we pay 60% of the materials cost. We work three days in three years to receive these benefits and make this global contribution. Okay, we're going to check it and keep measuring to see if that's really how it turns out. Another really great affirmation we got and benefit from our carbon farming is we were granted climate beneficial wool status. And if we want to market our stuff as a luxury fiber, we can with that label. Our partners in building healthy soils are our Wesson sheep, miniature sheep flock that we are in partnership with Leslie Atkins of Heartfelt Fiber Farm with and our livestock guardian dogs. And um, life is good, carbon farm. Come see our website if you want to learn more. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, very inspiring and very informative. We will have um, we will have this information of Amy's her slideshow posted <laughs> alongside of the the webinar on our website, and we'll also send that out to all the participants so you can follow up in more detail, um, looking at her careful documentation. And now I'm going to pass this on to Jim Jensen. <laughs> who is going to speak with us um, about his work at a different scale um, using a similar lens of carbon farming. Jim, do you want to go ahead and pull up your slides? Sure. Thank you. That was a great, great intro. All right, well, um, thank you for hosting this, this great uh, webinar. And I really wanna thank Heather and um, Rebecca and Amy for that just kind of great overview to get us started. And um, so yeah, a little different scale here, but um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my, my family's ranch and, and growing up and I'll try to be quick and brief. And then, you know, the similar work that we do actually um, at Malt where we, have a stewardship assistance program and we're helping with some of these same types of practices. So um, it's really great to see it on, on both sides. I actually do a lot more for other people than I do for myself, um, but really enjoy the opportunity to, to help people and see the change and see the, um, see all the work happen on the ground. Oops, I'm sorry. I'm trying to make sure I share this correctly. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, a little bit about our ranch. We come from a, or I come from kind of a traditional ranching background. My family's been here. I'm actually the sixth generation um, on the same plot of land in Tamales. Both sides of my family grew up there. Um, and I went to school, studied natural resources management, and ended up wanting to come back to the ranch, but um, also studied range and fire. And I was able to, to get my foot in the door with malt and help my community uh, really helped a lot of the families that I grew up around and help do conservation and working lands conservation and um, actually happened to start at Malt right when uh, the Red Carbon Project was was doing some demonstration farms. So I got to be a part of that and it was a great learning opportunity. Um, and, and just kind of real quick looking at this picture, you actually see that, you know, some, some of my ancestors and people in the area actually had the foresight to do um, carbon farming years ago. They, they strategically put in wind breaks, they actually had orchards um, in different parts of the ranches that they knew that they relied upon for, for food production in the winter. Um, you see where they strategically um, grew trees um, when there was a railroad coming through. Um, that was a potential um, incentive for them to have economic 
returns as well as you see all the efforts they did in dairying and potato farming and all the different ventures they took on that um, eventually they you know had to adapt to changing economic conditions but they a lot of our old time ranchers were carbon farmers um, in their own right so I, we have a lot to learn from the past and some of that's been lost and it's nice to see uh, that there's this movement uh, these things starting again so again just a little bit uh, about our ranch, we have about um, 400 ewes uh, on two different ranches, about 500 acres. We also graze some cattle. It's really just my dad and I. Uh, we have help for shearing. And then, um, you know, pretty much uh, we just do it all in, in addition to some other work that we do. So it's a labor of love. It's a lot of work, but uh, we operate on a pretty small budget. So it's, it's great to see the incentives that are becoming available. I'm just going to touch real quick on these bullet points that Heather Heather gave me and um, and talk a little bit about some of the other programs that are available. Heather already hit on a lot of those, so I'll, I'll be brief in talking about NRCS and, and programs like that. So what is creating a carbon farm plan? And, and, and I know it's already been touched on, um, but really just looking at the land through a carbon lens uh, that I know that'll be over and over through this presentation. Um, there's a good author, Courtney White, that's done, that I enjoyed reading, that helps uh, put some perspective on things. Um, but it really doesn't need to be over complex. It can be as simple as using Google Earth, um, walking your land, ground truth, identifying resource concerns. It's, it's really the same conserva conservation planning process that already exists. Um, and it's really just then taking a look at your, your GHG emissions and trying to uh, reduce those, reduce inputs, reduce feed, um, and then look at what practices you can implement on the ranch to, to decrease that. Another view from up on the hill of the ranch and uh, a solar water development project that we did, um, actually two of them, there's one in the, the big picture and then a, a solar well um, that actually was, was put in during the drought and uh, part of those were done through conservation projects. Um, so in prioritizing what, what I think is most um, important in a plan, it has to work for the farmer, the rancher, the landowner. What's your priority? Um, what's your operation? Are you focusing on habitat, wildlife? Um, and then looking at what kind of impacts those practices will have and then funding mechanisms that are out there. So um, our limitation on the, the ranches I worked on and my family's land was water. I realized that everything revolves around where you have water, your ability to change your grazing practices, to implement a grazing plan, your ability to plant trees or hedgerows or windbreaks. Um, everything relies on water. So um, we put a big effort into moving water, which we're very fortunate. We have the sun that can do that for us nowadays. And the old timers didn't have that technology. So now we can take a very low producing spring, um, add thousands of gallons of storage, that collect that water and then move it to a higher or different elevation. You could do the same from ponds um, or whatever, whatever works. So went in, I started working with NRCS, um, came up with a simple conservation plan to develop a spring or the spring was already there, but it couldn't support uh, the livestock grazing that I was trying to do to improve my, my soil health. So I distributed water uh, throughout the ranch from NRCD happened to have funding. Um, again, you'll hear that, RCDs are really a go-to um, organization to help you get off the ground, whether it's Sonoma RCD with LandSmart um, or different programs that RCDs provide. And, and they happen to have funding in the small state watershed to help with grazing practices. Um, so we, we actually matched multiple grants there with some of my own time and effort to do some of the work. Um, so getting back to this one, so we implemented that and it's been a huge improvement in being able to um, distribute livestock, change grazing, um, you, know, you know, kind of work on establishing more perennial species as well as managing areas that didn't used to get any grazing and they were over rested. Um, uh, following that, we did another conservation plan and this one we just uh, finished part of it with a water development. We have some cross fencing to, to install um, did a lot of the work myself with a contractor friend. I'm also doing some pasture seeding, you'll see there. Um, and this will help with a grazing plan that will then get up to about eight or nine pastures and improve my ability to rotate um, the sheep through this as well as cattle. And it'll help with 
managing sheep and lambing, and as well as uh, starting to rest riparian corridors and just improving grazing distribution timing and allowing better recovery periods for a lot of the grasses and, and trying to promote more perennial grasses. Um, so, you know, at, at Malt, we've, we partner with NRCS and Marin RCD on a daily basis. Um, and then I do as well when I'm trying to do work on the ranch. Um, other organizations that are available um, in this area is Point Blue and Straw um, to do plantings. And that's great. You get the kids involved and it's really, you know, gets back to community. Um, some other great resources that are out there are, are UC Rangelands. Um, uh, let's see, the CDFA Healthy Soils and Manure Management Grants, which I know have been discussed and will again be talked about. Um, Cooperative Extension, as I mentioned, is a great resource if you have general questions and RCDs. I just can't um, okay. talk about how important I think it is to communicate with your RCD. Other potential opportunities that are out there is we occasionally see fish uh, restoration grants. And so fish and wildlife it can be a resource for grants that they have that might be able to be match what you're trying to do with riparian restoration if you're on a stream that might have uh, uh, fish in it. So just another example of, of a partnership project we did at the Land Trust. This is in our ranch, but an example of, of distributing water to higher elevations. This was during the drought, so it looks pretty barren, but um, this really helped protect a riparian corridor and a pond uh, by getting this producer higher elevation water sources. So if you're able to partner, you can really get a lot of work done at very little cost to the landowner um, because in turn, these practices are providing water quality and public benefit. Another example, this is actually a riparian corridor on Stemple Creek Ranch that was restored about 20 years ago. Um, and just seeing the benefits and the nice kind of floodplain action along uh, along Stemple Creek, and that's that's all a result of first providing off-channel water. Then uh, another example, um, just repairing water infrastructure on ranches to improve grazing distribution. This is common what we do at, at, at the Land Trust Stewardship Assistance Program, and by doing this, we protect uh, high-quality you know ponds and habitat in different areas and improve grazing distribution. Um, so that's kind of a, a simple, you know, not, not only is it improving the distribution, but it's improving your livestock health too, by having clean water sources, keeping them out of the riparian zones. It's an example of a riparian corridor, um, just in Tomas that we helped, uh, kind of fence out and restore. You can see what it was over a 10 year period. You can see the example of sediment that was being lost and the carbon, um, and the difference 10 years later, and then the winter flow on the left. Um, so all that sediment is now being captured and slowing and acting as a sponge and keeping that water, you know, in the, in the water table, in the ground uh, and slowing and cleaning and filtering that. Uh, example of quick riparian corridor planting. Um, willows are a great resource. Um, they also take some management, but just protecting your riparian corridors. Uh, this is on another ranch in Tomales uh, that we helped and did a straw planting. That's only a year after planting. So those trees now are four or five feet tall. And it's great to see the wildlife that use those zones. Um, so, you know, I definitely encourage, you know, growth and diversification of the program here. And we, as well as on my own ranch, I see a lot of opportunities. Um, and I know these practices will get mentioned uh, again and again. Here's an example of no-till uh, farming in action and, and a, a climate beneficial practice list. Uh, on a dairy nearby and I think there's you know there's continued opportunities I'm excited to see that the Healthy Soils Initiative is making some adjustments and hope to actually apply uh, our ranch uh, to potentially get one of those grants to maybe partner with NRCS or RCD funding so that's exciting um, and I'll leave us with a little bit of Aldo Leopold who I think had it figured out in 1934 um, so that's about it but please uh, no, I went through that pretty fast. If you have more questions about my operation or, or the land trusts and conservation easements, feel free to, uh, to send them my way. Thank you, Jim. This is Rebecca. It's very wonderful to see all the work you are engaged in, especially on your leased land as well, which I have. Right. Seen. Thank you. Um, and so I think we'll, if everyone's okay, um, who's on the webinar now, we may go about five to maybe 10 minutes over. Just wanted to give you a heads up. And I wanted to introduce uh, Aaron Walkinshaw, who will be presenting on the Carbon Farm Cohort 
which is a peer-to-peer -peer network that's developing um, with a geographically, uh, I would say strategic geography approach. And she will tell you more in, um, right now. <laughs> Thank you. Hi friends. Um, the files are loading, the slides are loading. So um, yeah, thanks for being here. Uh, I wanna talk a little bit about this prototype program we are piloting this year called the Fibershed Carbon Farm Cohort. Um, I am going to go through quickly so that we can hear, we can have more time with Sarah Kaiser, uh, one of our cohort members. Um, if I go and the slides will be on the recording. Um, so this program is a program to bring together the geographic, these geographically close connected producers um, into community with each other as they work to create farms and ranches that are engines for ecosystem restoration and carbon sequestration. Um, the six members of the carbon farm cohort are Freestone Ranch, Monkey Ranch, Wire Rock Farm, Wild Garden Farm, Wild Oat Hollow, and Windrush Farm. Um, all six of these members had expressed to the members of the Fibershed team a sincere and deep interest in um, learning more about carbon farming and were already actively um, employing some of these methods and um, agricultural systems on their landscape on their own. And they were also very interested in developing a carbon farm plan. Uh, the goals of this program, there's a number of them there. A few to highlight to keep this brief is um, just that a central goal is to develop a small close community of land managers um, that are all working to manage their land landscape through the lens of carbon uh, so that they have other people to problem solve with, um, you know, talk about their innovative ideas um, and just not feel like they are alone in this. Um, at the end of this program, each farm and ranch or ranch will have a carbon farm plan that they can use to help them articulate this vision and um, also to, as they go through and implement the carbon farm practices. Um, the, this project that we, we're working on, this carbon farm cohort, is completely meant to complement the existing uh, programs that are out there through the RCB that Jim and a number of other presenters and Amy have highlighted. Um, at Fibershed, we can't emphasize enough how important a resource the RCDs are for the local producers. And we are just trying to develop something that can complement what the RCDs all are already doing in terms of carbon farm planning or may do in the future. Um, this is also a prototype model. So one of the goals of this cohort is to test this prototype and then just as necessary. Um, and then also to um, enable the members of the cohort to ex access funding for these, um, for the implementation of these carbon farm practices. So in the beginning, we did site visits. Um, as per the recommendation of the local RCDs that we visited with before we went to the producers, uh, they said, bring maps, go over the maps. Um, in, with the producers, we identified um, their farmer ranch goals, the history of the farmer ranch, if they knew them, um, areas of concern that they have. And also it was an opportunity to just kind of get an idea of where the, what their understanding of carbon farming already was, um, what things really were exciting to them so that we could keep the, uh, the plan in line with what drives them as land managers. Um, we then organized uh, field walks at, we've now done four out of the six um, cohort members. We've done field walks at four of them. And these were just really great opportunities to get the different members together um, and to encourage them to problem solve and come up with ideas. Um, we would invite a technical specialist, as we called them, <laughs> to each different field walk. And the purpose of that was just to bring in outside information, viewpoints, ideas, um, 
to the conversation and then in the field allow the kind of conversation to emerge and the questions to emerge. Some of the insights that came from the field walks are listed here on this slide. Um, some really great ones were that hedgerows be implemented in stages. I think a lot of our, our members were really almost relieved to think of it this way, especially if you're a smaller producer, this is helpful to, to feel like maybe you, instead of planting all of the plants out all at once, you go through in the first year and you plant your, um, what we kind of calling your key or your larger perennials. And then maybe in the next year, you come back and you backfill with the smaller um, forbs and grasses. And actually some of our members, our cohort members that have more experience with hedgerows, they said this was their preferred way to establish hedgerows because it created the microclimates that these smaller forbs and grasses would thrive better in, i.e. shade, um, and then probably more access to moisture, uh, to water. So that was a fun one that came up. Um, I'll go to the next slide. Uh, so another thing we in this process organized um, for the members was a great um, outside technical specialists, uh, certified rangeland professionals to develop grazing plans with the cohort members. Um, and Here's a few slides of different practices that are in place at the um, at a few of the different member landscapes. Uh, all of our members were doing things already that would fall under the purview of carbon farm planning or conservation um, farming. So here's um, management intensive grazing at Monkey Ranch and a number of different types of hedgerow installations um, at different various farms. Uh, in the cohort. Um, at Y Rock Farm, they have been uh, um, planting a no-till cover crop seed in their main pasture, a no-till cover crop, and then actually going through and spreading compost over that. And they've done that now for a few years running. So it's great to see that happening again. And um, with that, I would like to also introduce Sarah Kaiser. Um, Sarah does it all. She is a farmer a rancher, an herbalist, a mother, <laughs> a mentor, and an educator. Um, she and her family operate a Wild Oat Hollow farm in Pengrove, California. And she is also one of our inaugural. Thank you, everyone. Um, Sarah, I'll let you take it over from here. Thank you, Erin. That is a hard introduction to follow, but I'll try. Hold on one moment and I will get my screen up. Okay, hello everyone. My name is Sarah Kaiser. I own Wild Oat Hollow and then have a couple of projects underneath it. Of all the people that have spoken, I'm probably the smallest farm. We only own two acres in Pengrove, California, in this rural residential neighborhood where everybody is about two to five, sometimes 10 acres. And um, it's kind of a little community. And it's a little community that has stopped learning how to be um, helpful to each other. You know, people forget to say hello as they're walking down the street. And I am from the Midwest. <laughs> so I say hello to everyone and smile at everyone. And when I moved here and had the two acres, I got some sheep and some dairy goats that I had always wanted. And I saw the pastures on either side of me, uh, either un totally unused, either unmowed or heavily mowed. So they either left a lot of um, brush and things. Um, like that, that we're leaving fire hazards. And this was of course before the last couple of years of very severe fire hazards. Um, and I also just saw that land and the need for it to be nurtured. And I also saw a community that needed to be nurtured. A lot of the people in the neighborhood were elderly and, and couldn't manage their landscape as well. So what that developed was my Pengrove grazing project which is a community-based, ecologically sound land management system. 
Um, my project, again, developed through getting to know my neighbors, seeing unused pastures, knowing I wanted more sheep and goats than I had, and also wanting to really, really improve the soil of my land and the neighbor's land and to increase habitat for birds, and to create, create some fencing to keep them out of um, a lot of the seasonal creeks that run around here. We're quite low in Pengrove. Um, I, and also to assist neighbors in their brush and grass and fire risk management using carbon farming methods. Because I'm small and community-based and it's, it's collaborative, I only move my animals on the hoof, which means that all the pastures and lands that I would graze are all neighbors that I can walk with my sheep. So we're beginning, I'm be, I have had to be pretty create, creative because I move them for the most part by myself and um, um, I'm able to put up some temporary fencing to move them through and I have a couple of lead views that actually do a really good job of going where they're supposed to go. Um, so, so I'm moving them all in the hoof. And then the other thing I've been working with Richard King through the fiber shed cohort, grazing co cohort. And we've been talking about as I look around at some of these pastures, some of them are larger, have bigger brush needs, and they may be land that I can't graze. A lot of the old dairies that are at the end of our road are now be have now become um, uh, vineyards. So we're going to need to, you know, I would love to negotiate with them to bring sheep in, but I don't have the sheep to do that. So the project may develop into, or I hope it develops into, the ability to facilitate and train other grazers to bring in, collaborate relationships with other grazers that can do the work that I can't do due to my size limitations. Um, also, I'm planting hedgerows, trees, shrubs, medicinal plants in the pastures of graze. Sometimes that involves me planting, sometimes that involves me gleaning oak, uh, acorns, um, buckeye seeds, and spreading them around and watching where they're growing and then just protecting those areas. Um, in this project, the um, re relationship and collaboration is vital. So it's really about building community and collaboration as well as carbon sequestering. Here's just a couple of my animals out on different pastures at different times of the year. Um, they, uh, sorry, just looking at something. So we, I do run goats and sheep together. I find they graze really well together. Um, different times of the year, we do try, to, we are rotationally grazing through lots of different places. So the grass will get high and then we bring it down and we've worked with neighbors that are really okay with that grazing, grazing method. I also was very blessed to receive uh, the Norse North Face grant, and through that grant, I was able to get additional portable electric fencing and a charger, which is vital, as I, I have two um, different herds. This is our, this picture is a picture of our willow row hedgerow. We also were able to plant an alder elderberry hedgerow, and again, what, it, like what Aaron had said, I start out with the trees, I start out with the larger things, and then I'm going to add in additionals as, as the trees create the climate in which the next step of plants will grow well. Um, I also was able to get a plethora of different, different medicinal seeds and native herbs that will go into soaps and lotions, hydrosols for the soaps and lotions, um, anti-parasitic plants for the animals, and lastly we got um, our Magnus, the amazing Romney Ram, because one of the things that's vital in my ability to take manage more pastures for my neighbors is to be able to have a productive breeding program with really vital sturdy animals, and he's going to be um, pretty key in making that happen. There's just a couple more pictures. Here's up top is some of the medicinal herbs. This is Magnus with Zorro, the, the livestock guardian. He, Zorro handles one of my flocks and then my other flock. I have dogs to protect them. My daughter holding up some of an example of some of the root depth growth, growth of some of our perennial grasses. And we, I do plant a lot. I, I, I love plants. And I do a lot of trees, hedgerows. Every field we get, every pasture we go into, we're planting hedgerows or trees of some sort. This is a lot of elderberry. There is some bamboo that was planted before we were there, but all the hedgerows are very diverse and um, um, create also for a beneficial for pollinators, habitat for birds, a food source for birds, all sorts of things like that. The plantings and the, the, the trees also in all the pastures will add shade, shelter, um, medicinal benefits, anti-parasitic benefits, fodder for the livestock as the leaves fall, and it will improve carbon sequestering. Trees really help with carbon sequestering 
and they also create more microbial activity deep in the soil and allow the plants to communicate and share benefits to each other. Oh, like water. Here's the alder, um, elderberry hedgerow. It was on the left is where it was planted in the winter, and on the right is just the recent pictures. You can see how prolific they grew in one season. The elderberries grow really, 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 really fast, and they're great plants. So the, we did do some uh, soil carbon numbers. We had our soil carbon tested with, um, oops, sorry. So I wanted to show, and because this is so big, you can't see it all. So I'm going to just minimize so you can see all, all everything. Um, the pasture three is where we've been grazing the longest. So you can see our carbon numbers, the zero to 12, first, the top 15 inches of soil in pasture three is at 3.094. Um, the pig area where we'd had pigs, and I wanted to see what they had done to the carbon numbers, I was at 1.3. And um, then the radish site we had just started grazing was at 1.9. But what I think is really important too is the pasture we've been grazing the longest, the 30 to 45 centimeter inches deep into the ground, we have much higher carbon numbers. So we're actually showing um, that the grazing, how deep it's getting. And that was the biggest difference to me was how deep we're bringing in those soil numbers. And this is just what I was received to give you kind of a concept of how much um, sequestering, what it means in real numbers. So in the pasture site, um, the, your total carbon per acre down to the depth of 45 um, centimeters is 100, 102,485, which is about the equivalent of carbon contained in 19,000 gallons of oil, just to give you some real numbers. Here's the map of Wild Oak Hollow. This is just our two acres, not the land that we graze. Um, and I have my cursor here. So here's my willow row hedgerow. You can see a lot of the green this is actually the main pasture, and there wasn't a whole lot of trees planted here. The front acreage had a lot more trees, which we've added to as well. But I've put in Persian mulberry here, and then three Persian mulberries back here. This is our another seasonal creek, which is a willow um, hedgerow. We've added an alder, elderberry, the one I took a picture of that had a big change in a year is right here. Another alder row here, and I plan to plant, and then there's a valley oak here, and I plan to add a couple of chestnuts to the pasture. So I like to add these plants that are big, drought tolerant, long lasting trees, but also have the secondary benefit or food or nourishment or fodder or any of those things. And mulberries are incredibly benefit beneficial plant on that level. I just don't know how much more time I should keep talking. Um, but the, uh, one last thing I'll talk about, because I'm pretty sure I'm close on time here, um, is the, the secondary products that I make uh, with, um, I make soaps and lotions and from medicinal plants, and I glean from farmers all around that have excess lard, um, excess tallow, things like that, and I add that to my product. So I take a byproduct that would have been thrown away and I add it into my products to make really luxurious, wonderful soaps. All of my products have goat dairy in them in some way. All my goats are dairy animals and um, milk, dairy in, generally, in general is very, very heavily regulated. It's really hard to sell your dairy, your milk, unless you're a certified uh, dairy, but you can add it into soaps. You can feed it to pigs. You can use it as a secondary product and it can have a whole lot of value. Also with the chickens, um, Oh, we'll just skip all that. We, instead of selling just eggs, which there is gluts of eggs, especially free range eggs, I let my hens hatch out their chicks and sell their pullets. So rather than trying to push a product in into a heavily overwhelmed market, I just take my animals and let them create a different market for me in a place where I may be able to sell things on a much better scale. So I think that's all for me. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Thank you all. So Sarah, before you um, mute yourself, um, can you answer a quick question about what breed of sheep and goats do you oh, raise? Sure. Um, I have mini La Mancha goats, which are a cross between a standard La Mancha and a Nigerian dwarf. So they're 
a mid-sized goat in their dairy then has a little bit higher fat, so better for cheese making and stuff making. And I have a 100% pure partially registered Romney flock. And then I have what I call my fine fiber flock, which is a mix of a lot of different fine fiber sheep, Merino, Lincoln, Cormo, um, Blue Face Leicester, kind of mixed in and mixed breeding to add, um, to be able to play with some different mixed breeding and fine fibers. So I have two different sources of fine fiber. Wonderful. Thank yeah. You. That was a Thank question you. that came up. Okay. Thank you all for staying uh, with us. Most of you did. Um, and I apologize for going over time. If there are questions you have, if you're interested in participating, if you're interested in grants or um, being part of the next wave of a carbon farm cohort, or you have questions um, in general about any of the numbers we shared, um, and any question and all questions are welcome and you can direct them to um, any of us that are on the site and um, that was something that we're, we're here for you. So I just wanna thank you all so much for your participation and I hope you have a beautiful rest of your day and um, enjoy the, the oncoming rains if you are local. <laughs> all right, everyone, have a great day. Bye-bye.